open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, if you have your Bible open. Thanks for letting me take some time, church, and just kind of just loving our kids a little bit. I, I'm so thankful for what God's doing here at First Baptist Church and young people, the children. And I'm thankful for the adults as well. Don't, don't get me wrong, uh, adults. Uh, you, are, you are the mechanism God uses to bring these young people here, the mechanism God uses for discipleship in the home, and these kids are here. The teens are here because of moms and dads who love Jesus Christ. And so while I may, I may tease you a little bit about that, or I love kids more than you, I don't take it lightly the fact that you have decided to even at times or many times inconveniently bring your children back on a Sunday night. And I appreciate that. You've made it a priority, and I, and I am thankful for it. And I know God is thankful, and he'll, he'll use it. Um, I believe in the church because Jesus established it. It's right. And so thank you, parents, and those who, uh, whose kids are out of the house. Thank you. You're still faithful. You're finishing the race well. So God bless you. I know God wants you, and he's doing a great work here in little old Bridgeport as we follow his word. Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 10, where the Bible says this in Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Lord, as we look at your word tonight, I pray that you'd help us, direct us, instruct us, and change us. Lord, I thank you for these children and for these teenagers, for these adults who have professed a love for you and who want to follow you. Lord, on this Sunday night as we come back to gather around your word and worship, Lord, you've touched us in the service already, but I pray now that your word would be clear. Lord, help me to say what I should. I would be true to your word. Lord, most importantly, I ask your spirit would touch us and that we'd respond accordingly. Lord, may everything that you want to accomplish be accomplished in this time and this service. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning, it uses this word, wisdom. Wisdom is used 54 times in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom in our current time, in our current culture, would be the idea that someone would have some knowledge of something, some experience in something, and then have a practical way to apply that knowledge and experience. Or in essence, wisdom is not merely knowing and understanding what is right, but being able to apply it in life. Someone could, be, could, could have be said about them that they were wise or are wise in their finances. And by that, we would mean that not only would they know how to invest properly, and make sound financial decisions, but that they have done so. That they're wise in their financial decisions. If we were to say that someone was wise in the art of computers or computer problems, we would say that not only do they understand the essence of the computer, but that they could apply the knowledge in a practical sense and solve the problems that come by using one. If someone were to have wisdom in life, We would say that not only do they understand life, but that they have a practical application and a way on how to apply it in life. That perhaps they could say something in in a short, succinct way that would help us navigate a sticky situation or a hard, a hard relationship at work or a rough patch between a mom and a daughter or a dad and a son or perhaps between a husband and a wife or a coworker and a boss or employee and a boss. You see, wisdom is not just knowing and understanding, but doing. And in the Bible, biblical wisdom is not just knowing. That word is used, knowledge, 42 times in the book of Proverbs. Knowledge, knowing the word of God, and and parents and adults, we ought to teach our young people the word of God. We ought to know the word of God. We ought to memorize the word of God. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And biblical wisdom is not just knowing, that's just memorizing and having it on hand, but also understanding it, that's used 54 times in Proverbs, that's understanding how to apply it, but wisdom is then doing it. Wisdom in the book of Proverbs is that knowledge and understanding now applied in right decisions. In a life that that is in accordance to what we know from the Word of God and understand from the Word of God. Now, there's a difference in those three words. 
There are people that know the Bible. They could be skeptics. They could be critics. They could be atheists with no belief in God. They could be agnostic. And they could know the word of God, but not understand it because it is spiritually discerned. And it wouldn't change their life and the way they make decisions because they just know it. Furthermore, there are those who know it and those who can articulate it well, but still live like the devil. Still live after the flesh. And still don't follow what they know and understand. We would not say that they have biblical wisdom. No, biblical wisdom is knowing, understanding, and then doing, following, applying, practicing, whatever words you choose to use, what we know and understand from the Word of God. That is biblical wisdom. That is wisdom that God wants for you and I in our life. Wisdom for children, all right? Knowing, understanding, and following the Word of God from the simple truths. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. To teenagers, respect and honor. To to adults, for all of us to walk by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. That's knowing what faith is, understanding, and now following God by faith in my life. That is biblical wisdom. Wisdom is how to navigate life correctly according to God's plan. Wisdom is what choices that I make regarding how to raise my children. Wisdom is how to use my resources to the greatest glory of God, my time and my talents and my finances. Wisdom is to know how to answer questions and when to answer questions and challenges and critiques. Because the Bible gives us both sides of the instructions. There are times to answer a fool and times to not answer someone. Wisdom is the application of that. Wisdom is knowledge and and practical way in how to lead, how to love correctly, how to discipline, how to live for God. Everything we need to know about living for God comes from wisdom. And the Bible says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So before we can walk and navigate life correctly in wisdom with our finances, our family, our church, our worship, our job, our our, our house, every part of wisdom. Before we can do that, at the very beginning, is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what the Bible says, right? You see it? Shake and rattle. You see that? I'm not making it up, am I? The Bible says the beginning of, the, of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. To properly fear the Lord is not to cower in a corner or to look guiltily from side to side in, in potential shame. It's not walking on eggshells. It's living and knowing that I want to please the Lord and properly reverence God and respect his word and his ways. The fear of the Lord involves reverence and respect. By respect, it's not merely acknowledgement, but it's something I embrace. I don't just sit back and say, well, I respect God. I I reverence his ways. No, it's something that I cling to, the fear of the Lord. Now that we know the intro, Turn to Psalm 34. Because we're in Psalm 34 right now. And we will be until the Lord moves me on. It's my favorite psalm. In Psalm 34, we're going to learn about the fear of the Lord. Which is the beginning of wisdom. And if you want to make right choices that please God, if you want to know how to to live a life that will honor God then we have to learn the fear of the Lord. And David in Psalm 34, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will instruct us. Remember that when David came to this cave, the background for Psalm 34, he has fled Saul. He has fled the the, the situation that God has allowed him to be in, the threat on his life. He's run to a pagan king, and he has faked madness and ran away, now he's in this cave. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 22 that once he got to this cave, when he got there, that his family showed up and then about 400 other individuals 
the Bible says that we're distressed and had debt and were discontented. Or in essence, after his family showed up, the other 400 individuals were broken, messed up, disappointing people. Or all of us could be in that cave at that day. We all have problems. We may all have some debt in life. There are times we're discontented. We're broken. And here David, in Psalm 34, is going to convey a powerful truth. So look and please in Psalm 34, beginning in verse number 11. Where David now, I think, in my mind's eye, begins to assemble these 400 plus individuals. Now we know, we know from further passages that these men also came with families. We know that because later on they're going to come under attack at Ziklag and these men are going to lose their wives and their children. So while we know there are at least 400 there, I think it's probably safe to assume there were some young children there, there were some ladies there. So this message is for everybody. And you see David here in Psalm 34, I can picture him gathering now a group of individuals. And he says this, Come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you. And read with me the last part of that phrase. I will teach you, read it with me, the fear of the Lord. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so I want to know, what does this wisdom, how do I get to that point? I want to live the right way. You want to live the right way. I want to make good choices. Young people, teenagers, you want to make good choices. And David says, come, come, you children. It's like he's, he's calling out, come. You come and you come and, and sit down here. I'm going to teach you now. I'm going to instruct you in the way of the fear of the Lord. And so we ought to take note to what David's going to instruct us in so we can learn what David tr tried to teach and communicate that day so that we can live the way that God intended us to live. Close communication and communion with him, righteously fulfilling the role he's called us to. He begins with this verse or this thought, What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good. David challenges and encourages these people that day, these children, if I may. And it may be figurative children. It may be literal children. He may have had young people gathered around, which I think, but he might have to all those men and women, come you children. He said this, in essence, who doesn't want to love life and, and have a good life? Or in essence, he's saying this, living this way is good, not bad. Now, this is important because what we hear day in and day out is that God's way is not the best way. That God's way is not the most profitable way. In fact, we hear that if you live a life of faith, you're living on a crutch in life. That you're not mentally able to handle life because you have to have some type of thing to hold you up. And so if you walk by faith in this Christian way, then you're wasting your time. You don't using your real mind. And if you go to that church, you're just going to be part of a cult. And if you read the Bible, you're reading some dead man's words. And we know that's different. And David says, listen, this is the path that I'm going to show you is the best way. It's a good way. I tell you, my friend, it's the right way. And it's not always the popular way. And that even means here at church. Sometimes Christians look at other Christians and think, you're nuts. They say that this way is a crutch. This way is the way that children are stunted and demeaned. You can't tell a child he's wrong. Well, I'm sorry. Two plus two does not equal five. Well, that's wrong. And anyone who says otherwise, take them to a restaurant. Take them to McDonald's. All right? And when your meal equals five, give them four and say it's the same thing. It's not. Give them one, two, three, four dollars. Say that's the same as five, right? Two plus two equals five. They will instruct you in the way. At McDonald's. All right, the high school student knows this. But people say, in this way, children, they'll never develop properly if we follow God's way. 
If you follow God's way, then women have no worth, which is not true, contrary to the word of God. They'll say in this way people are hindered because they can't express themselves in the way that they feel they were born to. This can't be the right way. If you follow this way, this is the way where beautiful weather is wasted on Sundays because you have to go to that church building. My friends, David says here, this is the right way. And he calls out, listen, that if you desire life and love many days that, you, that he may see good, he's saying, listen here, then listen to what I'm going to say. Because if you love life, if you want to see good in your days, if you want to see a good life, this is the secret to it. It's not found on some self-help website for three easy payments of $199.99. And if you buy now, I'll give you my next free book as well. It's not found in some secret fad. It's found in the Word of God, which is available for all of us. Then he goes on with three instructions that are surprising instructions. You would think when he said, I'm teaching the fear of the Lord, that it would be something very, in essence, profound and very, very deep. Yet David keeps it right there for us. We're going to read what he says. And it's not going to be crazy, outlandish thoughts and commands. It's going to be simple. It's going to be understandable, and it's going to be practical. You know why? Because wisdom is simple, practical, understandable, and easy to apply in life. And he said, I'm going to teach you wisdom. I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord. And he says this. Let's read it together. What, um, keep, verse 13. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now imagine you're there that day. And David says, listen, everyone, you have problems, you're distressed, you have debt, you're discontent in life, you're broken. Come on, I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord. I'm going to teach you how to live a good life. I'm going to teach you how to, how to live righteously before God. I'm going to teach you how, how to please the Lord. And then he gives these instructions. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. If you were sitting there that day, would you not be like, Okay, David, when you get to the good stuff. All right, what's the secret now? All right, what's the secret sauce? What's the recipe? Where's it at? It's like David says, I just told you. It's right there. No, 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 David. No, no, no. I'm looking for something deep here. Give it to me straight. He said, I did. If I can, I give you three, three characteristics, three actions found in these verses. Number one. Real simple. Fear of the Lord is found, first of all, in right speech. Right speech. That's what he says. Keep thy tongue from evil, thy lips from speaking guile. The right kind of speech. Out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth speaketh. Someone who is in the fear of the Lord will have right speech because their heart is right with God. You'll be out and about, and as I am sometimes, and someone will, who knows I'm a pastor will say, well, pardon my French. Then they'll go on to say some things that I have no desire to hear in my life. Somehow when I say this little phrase and I can then talk any way I want to talk around whoever I want to talk to and about. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The fear of the Lord begins with some right speech. Speech that honors Jesus Christ, that honors God. Jokes that make a mockery of sin. Speech that is generally complaining and critical of others. Condescending toward fellow man. Always have to point out reality. Deceitfulness in your speech. All characteristics of someone who does not function in the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord begins with the right kind of speech. And the right kind of speech flows from the right kind of heart. And a heart that's right with God will have the right kind of speech. Well, will we be perfect? Not till glory. Not till glory. But will we be transformed? Every day we allow him to transform us. And David says, let me break it down for you plainly. Number one, you want the fear of the Lord? Have the right kind of speech. 
And if your speech isn't right, then you're not walking in the fear of the Lord. And you don't have the beginning of wisdom. If on the job site you speak plainly, if I can, or like a sailor, you're not walking in the fear of the Lord. You don't have God's wisdom, the beginning of wisdom in your life. The fear of the Lord is right speech from a right heart. He goes on, verse number 14, where he says this, Depart from evil and do good. The fear of the Lord is right speech. And number two, the fear of the Lord is right living. Or he says it this way, explains it this way, depart. Or maybe a more clear word to describe it to you is found in this idea, rebel. Rebel not against good, not against your parents, not against authority or government, but he says rebel against evil in your life. We could do with a healthy dose of evil rebellion in our life. When someone rebels, sometimes they protest. Sometimes they talk back. Sometimes they act out in a strong manner in rebellion. When the United States rebelled against the British government, they shot at them. And it would help us in our life, in your life, in my life, if we began to shoot and to rebel against evil in our life. Rather than coddle it and give it a place of, of comfort in my spirit or my life or my house, or my mind, or on my phone, wherever it may be, rather than coddle it, I rebel against it. And I say, the New Testament says, get thee behind me. Flee also youthful lust. You see, the fear of the Lord is right speech, but it's right living. Depart from evil, rebel against it, and do good. It's about choices. And the choice I have to make is to rebel against evil and to do right. It is that simple. No, yes. And when I say yes to evil, I'm saying no to right. And when I say no to evil, I'm saying yes to right. I cannot say no, no, and yes, yes. I either say no or yes, and one excludes the other. David makes it real simple. It's the right kind of speech, and it's right living or the right kind of choices. Grandma Swain was here with this ministry for many years, 29, I believe. Bill Swain, principal here, who, who preceded me as principal, and Grandma Swain passed away a few years ago after a battle with cancer. Around that hospital bed, she often would say this phrase, just say yes, and you'll be blessed. So simple, so succinct, yet so profound. And in essence, it's what David says. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. You have the right kind of speech. You have the right kind of living. And look at the last one at the end of verse number 14. Seek peace and pursue it. I have right speech. I have right choices, right living. And number three, I have right relationships. We're living in a society that is starting to eliminate relationships. I can do things from afar. I can drive through at a bank and never communicate with anyone. I can sit from home and, and I'm glad for live stream, but, but some will use it as an excuse and others as, as a necessary thing, and I'm glad for it. But we know some would use live stream as an excuse. I don't have to go to church, I can live stream it. I go to Walmart, I don't have to have anyone check me out, I can check myself out. Yay. I can have friends that are out there in cyberspace, conversations. I can live a life in an alternate reality, all things that preclude a relationship. And yet God says that if I'm going to live for wisdom and the fear of the Lord, I must make sure my relationships are correct and they're peaceful and I seek for it, I strive for it, I work for it, and then I pursue it, I run after it. The church is a place that this should begin. At church, as Christians, we should have peace among the brethren, the unity of the Spirit. There should not be disgruntled church members with each other. This is contrary to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Now, being in a church of any size, 
much less one this size, there will be people that you like more than others. There are some personalities in this room that you will connect with and some that will drive you nuts and bonkers. Yet, the Bible does not make allowance for personalities. It doesn't make provision for the flesh. In fact, the Bible says, make not provision for the flesh. The Bible says that I'm supposed to seek peace and pursue it. That my relationships are right. They went around me. And it should start here in the church house. If we can't get along, then how can we expect the world to get along? The unity of the Spirit. Paul says, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. In Acts, Paul said, and herein do I exercise myself to have a con always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. A man was working on a crossword puzzle. He got stumped by a certain question. The question was this, what's a four-letter word for a strong emotional reaction toward a difficult person? And immediately, his co-worker said, hate, H-A-T-E. And, and then just as quickly, another co-worker said, no, it's love, L-O-V-E. You see, there are always difficult people. We're all facing the same crossword puzzle. The issue is not the question we face. The issue is the answer that we supply. And David says, I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord. It's right speech. It's right living. And it's right relationships. I want you to turn to one more passage to see this one more time. Because the Bible is beautiful how it builds on itself. So would you please turn to James chapter 3. James is a book of wisdom. In fact, in James, it says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God which giveth to all men liberally. Some have called James the Proverbs of the New Testament. So it's no surprise that James would deal with the fear of the Lord. But he deals with it differently than you might imagine. I want to read you some verses, give you one more example than we've done tonight. James chapter 3, he begins a chapter dealing with our mouth. We can see that clearly. The tongue is a fire, world of iniquity. But look, plays in verse number 10, where he says this, Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does that sound like right speech to you? Yes or no? But James is saying, let's have some right speech, Christian. He goes on to the fountain sent forth at the same place, sweet water and bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh? Question tonight, is your speech pleasing to the Lord? Or are you a dual water fountain? Where salt water and sweet water come out of it. Look in verse 13. Next verse. Who is... A wise man and endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Sounds like right living to me, doesn't it? Sounds like James has gone from right speech to right living. He goes on, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. So you know. I don't know what this child will say. They say yes and no, but they're all over the place. And look, please, in verse number 16. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. Sounds like right relationships, doesn't it? And easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. See how James, in the beauty of the word of God, brings to us the exact same concepts found in Psalm chapter 34. That wisdom, the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, begins with right speech. Speech ought to please God. And listen, it's a big deal. Well, I slip every once in a while. God says it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Right living. It's a big deal to say yes. Well, I slip up every once in a while. No, God says it's a big deal. You say yes to me. 
You say no to the flesh. You say no to, to, the, to evil. And right relationships. Well, like most people, but some people I just don't like. My Bible says seek peace and pursue it. It's not hard to pursue peace with those we like. It's hard to pursue peace with those that irritate us. It was a good Christian lady. She owned two prize chickens. One day they got out of their run and into the garden of an ill-tempered neighbor. The neighbor was so incensed and so angry that he wrung the necks of the chickens and threw them back over the fence. We can imagine that this lady was upset and her kids saw that. The story goes, they wondered what their mom would do when they saw what he had done. She didn't rush over. She didn't scream at him. That would be the response of some of us, wouldn't it? Do you know what you did? Their speech would go out the window. Their choices would be gone and the peace would, be, would flee us. She took both the birds. She dressed them out and prepared two chicken pies. She took one over to the man who had killed the chickens, her two prize chickens, the two apparently that she loved as pets. And she apologized about not being more careful about keeping her chickens in her own yard. The children, she said her children hid in a bush by the fence, expecting to see an angry scene from the neighbor. But instead, much to their surprise, he was speechless. The chicken pie and the apology filled him with a burning sense of shame. And my friends, that is wisdom. You say, how can I navigate this life? Fear of the Lord. Speech that comes from a heart that's right with God. Choices where I say no and I say yes. Where are my relationships on this side of heaven? I seek them to be right. Peaceful. And David says, this is the path that's good. Thank you.